Hi there, welcome back. Welcome back to another video in this uh, restoration series for the Grundig 6001. I wanted to get some joy out of this. I wanted to power it on, make sure that the basics are working. So I had quite a bit to do and um, I won't give the game away, but by the end we'll see some progress. I'm going to go into a little bit of this schematic, which uh, some of you like, some of you don't like. If you don't like it, well, you can click forward to this point here, right? That's where the uh, schematic description ends and the actual restoration begins. You can see she's naked behind me and uh, it should be fun. Enjoy. Unquestionably, the first thing you need to do is get your service manuals. And on this particular set, there are quite a few available. Unfortunately, none of them are in English or completely in English. I found German, I found French. But anyway, here's the German one. It's pretty complete. A lot of alignment instructions. Some shots of the PCBs, the various PCBs. And you have a full schematic. And this thing is pretty big. As you can see, this is at 13% up here. So this is pretty complete and detailed. So if I want to go in, that's how clear it is, which is good. Carry on down. Got some more stuff. This is important because we're going to need that on uh, restringing that <laughs> the tuner, technical data, and so on. But the most important thing that I normally do is I take this one here and I create a separate file just by itself. Here it is. And as you can see, I've made it as simple as possible. If we compare the two, you can see there's a lot more information on here, here at the top which I don't really need. So I have deleted all that and left just the pertinent information. In some cases, I left the instructions, just the English ones for me. And I've started working on it, as you can see. And the important bit was to sort out the power supply. Now we've got various ways of powering this thing. We've got a tag strip for the power pack over here and positive, negative, and there's that center sensor tap as well. And that goes to a switch here, which is the uh, line or battery switch. And line means that you are going to use the external supply coming into that DC jack, which is, yeah, it's got a lot of switching functions on here. But ultimately, that's the source, the main source of power, because this thing gets switched in or out, depending on the position of that toggle. There's a little clip on there when you plug in a... Um, a jack, it's a special jack. This thing disconnects the power packs and it allows the external power to come in. And then we've got, if we don't have this, we've got that power pack, we've got that battery connector as well. Um, yeah, I think that's the one that I desoldered. Yeah, that's it. That's inside. Everything that's inside the dotted line is, is sort of off board. So that's the, the three connections I've desoldered. There's the minus 9 volts, the plus 9 volts, and that central sensor contact, which quite honestly, I don't know what it's for. I think it's probably a sensor for the battery charger, because this thing would charge a battery. And finally, we come up with the important bits, which is where's ground and where's supply. Now, I can, I can choose how I'm going to supply this. For testing, I'll probably use that uh, battery clip that's coming out the back, or even these connectors here, which is pretty useful. And then I need to make sure the switch is in the right position, but I should get power into this thing. And then I wanted to figure out where the power lines were, and I was a little bit confused. The positive ultimately gets to here, the on-off switch, and um, it goes up here, the red line. It also goes up here, red line, and then it sort of disappears which uh, is not a good thing. And then I realized why. This line that goes up here and there gets to this point and there was an adjust with resistor to 7.2 volt mark indicating metered operating voltage. So this is an adjustment which I realized is for that uh, battery level meter. Okay, If that's the adjustment for the battery level, then this must be the positive supply, the main positive supply the one that will always have power as long as your on-off switch is on. And then I saw this. This thing here is a 100 ohm resistor. 
It goes to here, there's a uh, 1000 microfarad capacitor, 10 volts, note you should add 9 volts here, this is a 10 volt capacitor which is not a good thing, there's another one, and it goes through 100 ohm resistor and it goes to a chassis connection. So that means that some of this chassis is actually our positive supply, positive ground as it were, and then the negative, which is this grey one that I painted in, this is the one that snakes around everywhere, which is one of them has to. If you've got uh, one of the power lines to the chassis, then the other one has got to snake around and they've uh, connected the positive to the chassis via a 100 ohm resistor and a filter cap. This is just a basically an RC filter which takes any noise out of the uh, main supply and that gets sent to your chassis. So that's good. We know where our positive is coming from. Wherever we see um, a chassis connection, I'm sure if we look around we'll find some. Here's one. That'll be positive, not negative. That's the first thing you've got to be careful with. And then the negative snakes all the way around, as I've shown here. It goes all the way to this board or this section of the board. It goes up here, goes across here, goes up. So we've got the answer to that. And the first thing I want to look at is, since we've got the power line sorted out, is the audio board. Um, I haven't tested the power yet because something made this thing spark or short or whatever and uh, so connecting power here would just be a waste of time. I need to figure out what is causing that problem and my first guess would be these capacitors because that's where it's going to and these capacitors could be the ones that are either shorted or very very leaky so I'll just change them out and we need to figure out where this is. It's not difficult. You've got to look for two output transistors, these two guys. T19 and T20. This is in a push-pull arrangement. We've got a trimmer here which this will probably be, yep, we've got an idle current setting over here. So you see there's a jumper. So somewhere along the line we need to bias these two transistors to get the optimum audio. That then obviously goes to the internal speaker, external speaker. This is the external speaker socket which disconnects the internal speaker. Nothing too unusual here, but we've got trimmers here. We've got that trimmer here. One of them will be for the biasing and the other one will probably be, is another trimmer. This one is set as a variable resistor. Well, that one's slightly different arrangement, but this will probably be um, DC, DC operating point over here. Now, the way this works is if you've got push-pull and you don't have a negative supply and a positive supply, you've got ground and a supply. In this case, it's, it's called that ground. <laughs> but you've got a negative supply. You need to put this right in the middle. You should put this right in the middle because then you've got uh, capacitive coupling which separates the audio from that DC operating point. So somewhere along the line, actually it doesn't say 4.5, it says 4.2 volts. Here it is. That point there needs to be adjusted to 4.2 volts. Now they don't tell us how to adjust it. So one of these will be setting that to 4.2. The other one will be setting that to 7.5. And it's going to be a little bit of trial and error. But I'm going to get this section working. And it's easy to test this section once it is working because we can go back here. This is the input of the audio to the, this is the power amp board. There's another electrolytic. So we need to sort those out. Electrolytics and tantalums on these radios I am skeptical about, so I'll be replacing them all. There's our volume control. This volume control has got the um, psychological loudness. It's got taps on it with different tone shaping elements. Yes, that was the cat. And if we go back here, back here, back here, there's our uh, treble control. There's our bass control. So that means that our audio is coming in here. And we've got, oh, here it is. That's that uh, audio DIN jacket uh, socket at the back. And it says 1 and 2 is recording and 3, 5 and 2 is playback. So 3, 5 and 2. So 3 and 5, that's shorted out. 2, okay, so this is obviously mono. So you've got ground here. Yep, yeah, that's 0. That's continuation of that gray line and your signal will go into either 3 or 5, and you should then have an audio signal coming in. Um, coming in from here. 
and here is your TA switch. So you select TA on the top and you put a signal into the back here, 3 and 5, and that signal should come out here, comes into here, there, all the way there. You can adjust the uh, two um, tone controls, goes through all that, adjust the volume, and then, then finally goes to the output stage. So this is what we're going to look at from there, through all that, through all that, but we can't do anything without making sure that these guys are good. And these guys need to be good because this is where the power starts. If this power is shorted somewhere here, it won't get anywhere else onto the radio. It's certainly, all this is passive, as you can see. All these components from the input here, it's all passive components. In other words, none of this needs power, really, does it? I'm just trying to check something here. Why is this, why is this guy switchable? If you switch, the power comes from there, goes to there, and it switches on there. And when you switch it off, what are you doing? You are... Why are you switching it on to here? This is odd. That shouldn't be there. This is sort of a cutoff, I think. I think what it does is, like some of the tube radios, it shorts out the uh, input signal to ground. In this case, the supply is ground, really. So it shorts, yeah, that's it. It shorts that signal. That's where your main signal's coming in. After it goes through the tone controls, it's there before it gets wiped away to the audio amp. But if you suddenly, when you switch it off, you don't want this thing to keep playing while these capacitors discharge, so you short this signal all the way to ground. And ground, as I said, is this guy because once it gets up there through a 100 ohm resistor, which is pretty small, there's ground. Okay, makes sense. So here we are. We need to work on this section. Now this section is on a board with other stuff on it. If we follow this, this dotted line, if you follow this line here, you see that? There, 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 there. That's a section, and then it actually has more, because this dotted line goes across here, and it sort of sneaks up into this section as well, and it has this included in it as well. And that also makes sense, because if we look at the board where these guys are, there's a lot more stuff on there, and that stuff is this stuff up here. So if we look at the service manual, and try and find the AF board. Where is the AF board? AF board, here we go. This is the RF board, the RF board component side, RF board solder side. Here's the AF board. So it's, the, yeah, okay. It's the AF and IF board. AF and IF printed board component side. So here we've got those two transistors, T20 and T19. Those are the uh, power push-pull. There's that one trimmer that we talked about. There'll be another trimmer somewhere else. Can't remember, can't see where it is, but we'll find it. I'm trying to figure out where that, oh, there's that, uh, see that jumper? That's the jumper we need to remove and measure 7.5 milliamps. So we need to find this on the underside, desolder it. Usually it's just a, a solder blob. Desolder it and um, put a ammeter across it and measure the current. Okay, let's go and look at the radio and see how we get this done. Here is the, the back end here. I've already removed these two screws and polished them and cleaned the insides and all that. Not much to see here. It's all accessible from the back. This is that battery clip that I'm thinking of using. No, I won't use this one. I'll use these two, these three points here. There's uh, black and red and there's that yellow. That's that sensor clip. This is where I desoldered that battery connector from. These clips are have been cleaned out and you can actually use them to clip um, the power supply to. So I'll be using those. This switch is now working. It was just jammed. And here we've got our um, DIN socket. So what is it? Three and five and, and the middle one. Middle one is ground. So we'll be able to use this to uh, test a a signal, an audio signal, see if it goes through. But the important thing is, okay, I figured that out. I figured out, well, the on-off switch is over here. 
Okay, but important thing is we can see all that at the back and everything seems to be fine. Now the bits we're interested in are on this board over here, or this assembly. We see some big capacitors that gives it all away. There those two transistors connected on there. That's T20 and T19. We've got that trimmer we talked about here. There's another trimmer up here. I'm not sure which one. That one is the... I'm not sure which one is the uh, bias and which one is the, um, the offset or the DC point. But as you can see, it's got all that. And then it's got all these things. That's the RF board. That's the RF section that they show on that uh, on the schematic. And the way to take this off, it's actually quite neat. This thing seems to have sort of hinges on here, but I figured out there are two screws, one up there and one down here, and then this thing sort of hinges out. That's the theory. Let's see if it works. There are a lot of wires on the back here, so you want to be careful. Obviously, no power yet. And two. Now, did our theory work? It's still sort of stuck at the back. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, we can get to them. Now, what I'm going to do next is I'm just going to remove these caps, replace these caps first. Won't even test them. There's another one there. I'll replace all the electrolytics, and if there are any tantalums, I'll do that as well. And then I think we'll be ready to look for that little tag you know the little jumper on the underside it's pretty clear on the board it's somewhere over here i'll have to just look on the underside the underside is a bit of a mess but we'll find it and um, set this up to apply power to it see what we get well quite a bit of time has passed and um, all of three four capacitors were changed yippee this is not a quick job <laughs> definitely not a quick job and um, you have to take care of a few things i'll uh, tell you right now these tracks on here on the underside of that board are incredibly fragile the first uh, capacitor I took out there immediately broke the the track so I had to repair it which meant that um, the others I had to do with special care even more care but anyway what I've done so far if we look at the uh, schematic I've replaced the four electrolytic capacitors the uh, coupling one at the end there going to the speakers is uh, slightly better quality the others are fine. They're all 25 volts. I don't even, I don't think you can get 10 volts anymore. I certainly don't have them. But um, what I did do is I opened up that jumper and I've got a meter. I've got that meter, big brother, measuring milliamps across two little wires that I've soldered to the jumper. So the current has to go through the meter. I've got that guy measuring the voltage at the two emitters of the output transistors, meaning the... Um, the output that goes to the speaker through that uh, coupling capacitor. And they say you should get 4.2 volts there. And they talk about two trimmers. One is 560, R560, and the other one is R558. Well, I've got to tell you, I can't find R558. But let me show you what happens. I've got the power supply on. I do now. And I have it set to 9 volts with a 50 milliamp current maximum current limit i want very little current limit on here so that if there's something wrong i don't fry anything and i'm going to switch it on nothing happens because i believe that is off there we go okay what are we seeing here well, we've got 4.23 volts where it's supposed to be 4.2 and we've got 6.6 .6 where it's supposed to be 7.5 milliamps. So that's not far off, is it? Not far off at all. In fact, it's, it's pretty good. Don't hear anything, but I haven't got anything connected. So I'm trying to, I'm going to try and up that a bit and um, I'm going to adjust the one trimmer that I've got access to, which is R560, and see what happens. Now this is supposed to be left for a while so it can uh, settle down, but let's try anyway. Let's see what happens. Okay. Too high. Damn, that's sensitive. That is so sensitive. 
bit too high. See if it creeps up, and it does. And that's basically it. The filter capacitors have been changed. The biasing of the output transistors has been done. And it wasn't that far off. And they tell you to do it with 9 volts, which is what I've got up there on the power supply. So I think we're good. I think we're good. I'm going to leave that for a while. It'll probably creep up a bit more. I'll adjust it to 7.5 and then see, see how far we go. So let me show you what I'm going to do next. Here's what we've got so far. One, two, three, four capacitors replaced. 220 here. It says 250, but um, the one they have in there is actually a 220. So that's what I've got in. And I am I have opened that little jumper there. I've got the milliammeter across there. I've got a voltmeter stuck to this point here between that and ground. It says here 4.2 volts, so that's what I've been measuring. I'm measuring 4.23 at the moment. And while I've been talking, that thing's scraped up to 7.7 .7 milliamps, where it says 7.5, and that's pretty good. I let it uh, creep up a bit more and see what happens. So this whole section here doesn't seem to have the inclination to blow up, which is good. So the next step is to look at this section here. This is the tone control section and volume control, which feeds the... Uh, output and I'm going to be feeding a signal in here on between 3 and 2. 2 is the common ground, 3 and 5 are shorted so that's the input it says here 3 and 5 to 2 is playback. When you activate the uh, external input, the TA, those jumpers disappear so these are not shorted out and if I feed a signal in here I should hear it and I've got the speaker connected to the external speaker, the speaker wires. So I should be able to hear it, but I'm going to do some testing, cleaning on here. This, these things will definitely need cleaning, maybe even that switch. There's not much else here. There are not any active components on here. There aren't any electrolytics on here. So I think the only problem we might have is really dirty um, pots. So let me do that and I'll come back and we'll test it, see what the result is like. I thought I'd be able to get away with uh, cleaning that um, tone section without removing it from the front or the top cover. As it turns out, that was not going to work. So I decided to remove it. It's not too complicated. You remove about four screws and it comes out. And those spots need some serious cleaning. So here we go. Um, those spots are now ready to be cleaned and checked and everything else. And the knobs can now be dealt with. And if you are a hoarder like me, you sometimes get lucky. I've been hoarding this can of chrome spray paint for I don't know how long. Always wondered when I was going to throw it out because it is a bit garish for anything else. But for these pots, it's perfect. So I just prepare the pots by cleaning them, uh, sanding them a little bit with wet and dry just to get the surface of it roughened up on the top and uh, spraying it now and seeing how that comes out. It should come out quite well. We'll see. And here we have this section which is now bare. I actually removed the, um, the audio connections to that panel because I wanted to clean up inside here pretty well. It needed it. And I needed to clean these spots, which for some reason, these knobs, I can't take them out. I don't want to force it. I've had a situation in the past where I forced this and it broke down at the bottom. I don't want to force it, so I prefer to do it there and um, this top now is completely cleaned. That board is completely cleaned up. The pots have been uh, cleaned as well. And let's have a look at the top cover and see what we've got. This top plate needed some help. There were lots and lots of little white drops on there, paint drops. I still haven't been able to get them all. If you try too hard, you scratch the plastic. There are a few stains and marks that you can't get rid of here, but I've done my best. Clean this up, try to put a little bit of polish on there. But again, you've got to be careful, or those uh, symbols disappear. On here, which is sort of that faux leather, I did what I've done before, and actually which one of you recommended, which is use shoe polish. It works pretty well. And that's the best it's going to be. It's not perfect, but it's a damn sight better than it was. 
This switch over here was also cleaned properly. This is where the audio gets uh, switched between the audio jack, well, first audio jack, and then it goes to there. And that switch allows you to select the internal speaker or the external speaker. So that's been cleaned as well. It's a very simple switch. I think this thing's about ready. Let's have a look at those pots and see how they came out. Well, this is a surprise. They came out beautifully. So all the little indents on there got cleaned. These are going to look beautiful on here. I'm really happy with this. That paint was worth saving. Now I'm just going to put these guys back in, make sure that they are in the right orientation. There we go. One of them is different to the others. The, um, this goes from minimum to max. One of them is actually reversed. And it's on purpose, I think. There we go. Okay. Is that right? I think I've got one of these in the wrong way around. I had drawn. That one goes there. Let me correct that. That is now correct. And uh, the pots have been cleaned, so they're moving nice and smoothly. They'll obviously stick out like that. But there's something else here. I'm not going to put that one in yet for a second because I want to show you something. See this? That's broken off from the little trimmer capacitor over there. So I need to find out where it came from, where it broke from, reconnect it before I put all this back. Okay, I'm glad I did this so I wouldn't have seen that. And after a lot of very meticulous hassling, that's done. I had to make a little bracket there, a little uh, tag, because the tag on there had broken. I had to remove that little nut, very, very small, and I managed to make one and just add it on there and then solder the connection to it, because you can't really solder to that screw. You shouldn't. So that's done. Okay, I'm glad I caught that. Time to put this whole thing back. And that means soldering these connections back to the uh, top cover. I took a photo of this to make sure I got the right colors, the right wires in the right place. I'm going to solder those back and put it back in there, put those screws on, and we should be good to go. Now I'm about ready to test this. I've got this on 9 volts, 50 milliamp current limit. I don't want to risk it. I've got that uh, supply going into those two points over there, which are easily accessed. I've got the signal generator going into the required pins for playback. That's pin 2, the black one. And the yellow one here, where the signal comes in, is uh, pins 2 and 5, or is it 3 and 5, the one for playback. I have the speaker connected. It's just a test speaker over here. I've got TA in. Switch is on, and I'm going to activate the power supply. It's drawing 30 milliamps. Oh, it would help if I... Oh, yeah, brilliant. That's not good. Stopped. Could be... Something is not a good connection here. It's the jack at the back here, I think. It's that switch. I need to remove that and clean that again. Yeah, that's definitely not good over there. But we've got audio.
These are not scratchy, they don't affect much because this is a 1 kHz sine wave. That will affect, affect slightly, that's the treble. The switching is definitely dirty. So I need to clean those uh, selector switches at the back, which I hadn't done yet, which is fine. I just wanted to test the audio. And there's one more thing that I will be testing, but I need to think about it first. Um, I need to check some things. This thing uses a positive ground. Because, because it uses a positive ground, I just want to check the schematic again and see whether this is referenced to positive ground. And um, this thing has been going on for too long. I need a break. So I'm going to do that in the next one. If I had this as positive ground, I've got the signal generator um, looking for a negative ground. It doesn't matter, but I could be shorting it out if I put this on the scope. And I want to put this on the scope, see what kind of, uh, what kind of fidelity we get. Put that off. And I want to then move on and do the test on the radio sections. But I'm happy. The, uh, the audio section is working. It's biased correctly, and I think we're ready to move on. I really am pleased with that. I need to clean that switch. I need to clean the contacts at the back there, the uh, selector switches. Those are accessed from here. They need a lot of attention. You just spray stuff in and you just keep trying. Leave it overnight, do it again. It doesn't clean up on the first try. I've noticed that. So you just have to be patient. This thing will have to come out again, obviously, because I need to restring this thing. And uh, I notice the string goes over the top there, but I'm not too worried about that. It's just two screws on here. They come off. I haven't even tightened them too well because I thought I might have to go back to that guy. And it looks like I do. Now, I want to thank you all for your company. And uh, if you've stuck around, thank you. And if you've enjoyed that, click like, share, subscribe and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel directly, you can do so on Patreon. And since this is definitely the last video of the year for me, uh, I want to wish you all a happy new year. I really pray that uh, the coming year brings us some good stuff and that we can get to the end of 2022 a lot more optimistic, a lot more free and uh, put some of this rubbish behind us. Once again, thanks for watching. Bye for now and definitely stay safe.